Good afternoon. I'm, I'm so thrilled that you're all joining us this afternoon for a very, very special program. Um, I have the pleasure of making a couple of very brief administrative announcements before I turn the floor over to the dean of our law school. I think we need you to use the PA. Oh, okay. Sorry. That's quite Man, right. I, the PA. I thought I was loud enough, but I'm happy to be even louder. Thank you, Brad. Um, first and foremost, our students um, who are attending this program today would like to receive ethics credit. Please make sure you fill out the blue form and you can leave it just on the table on your way out here or with Rachel Lawrence who's standing in the back of the, of the auditorium. Um, my other administrative announcement that I'd like to make is um, we are especially thrilled this, this afternoon to welcome um, a, a Netflix documentary crew who will be filming this presentation as part of a a series on the Innocence Project. So Brad and Kevin are here with us today. If you have a question that you'd like to ask at the end of our program, you will be filmed, and you may be, um, you may, that film may be used in the final documentary. If you do not want to be filmed, please see Brad or Kevin, and we will be happy to seat you in a spot that you will not be filmed this afternoon. Anything else for Brad or Kevin? No, you can come up to us afterwards and just let us know if anybody's got an issue, and we'll take your picture so we when we uh, sit in the edit room, we know who's who. And if everybody can just silence their phones, thank you very much. Thank you both very much. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to um, open the podium up and welcome to the floor the Dean of our law school, Regina Jefferson. Brian Starlitz, who is a former student of mine, a graduate of the Columbus School of Law class of 1998, a member of our alumni council, and leader of the law firm of LeClaire Ryan's Compliance, Investigations, and White Collar Team. He lives in Alexandria with his wife Anna and three children. Mr. Starlitz formerly served as a public defender for the Legal Aid Society in Brooklyn, New York and has received many awards for his dedication to pro, pro bono services. These honors include the Light of Justice Award from the Texas Defender Service and the 2014 Caritas Award, the highest honor awarded by Catholic Charities in the Archdiocese of Washington in recognition of professionals who advocate on behalf of vulnerable and oppressed populations. In addition to his successful litigation practice, Mr. Strollers is a Washington Post bestseller author of Race and Justice on Death Row, The Race Against Time and Texas to Free an Innocent Man. Today, we are fortunate to have Brian here to discuss the subject of his book, one of the most, if not the most, important cases in his career, his representation of Alfred Duane Brown. And it is indeed also my honor to introduce Alfred Duane Brown. Mr. Brown spent 12 years and 62 days in prison for a crime he did not commit. He is the 154th death row exoneree nationwide and the 13th exoneree from the state of Texas. In June of 2015, after spending 4,442 days behind bars, Mr. Brown was finally declared a free man. Mr. Brown now lives in Louisiana, is enjoying his freedom, and is telling his story so an injustice like this does not happen again. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Dean Jefferson. I was thrilled to hear your name, the interim dean. These students are so fortunate. You were one of my favorite professors, even though I only understood about half of what you told me. Taxation is pretty hard. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you, Katie, for setting this up, for being a supporter of Dwayne's case from the very beginning, for your leadership, for mentoring these minds, and for your friendship. Thank you. Where's Joan Grassi? She here? One of my favorite people in the whole school. There you go, Joan. The ageless, timeless, wonderful wonder of Joan Grassi. You are all so fortunate. She puts these things together like that, and she's amazing. Thank you, Joan. Love you. And so, 
My 20 year reunion is next week. In fact, I met my wife here at one of those benches right out there. And now we have three CUA law babies. Three little justice warriors. But if you would have told me 20 years ago, and I'd be sitting here, that I'd be back here with a Netflix crew <laughs> and exoneree, I would have said, you're out of your mind. But I am here because of what I learned here in these three years. Thank you to Kate Edwards for being here. You are, uh, she's Dwayne's civil lawyer. And I'm so grateful that you have joined me in the fight and being a passionate advocate for Dwayne and for justice. So I thank you for being here. For the parents who are here, thank you for supporting these students, especially the first years who are so nervous and scared right now. Uh, it's, all, it's all gonna be okay, you're gonna pass. Don't worry, but please, for the parents, coddle them. I know that's just like, love them, buy them food, take good care of them, text them. First year really stinks. <laughs> they'll be fine. Eventually, they'll pass them all. I promise you. And to the students, thank you for being here. You are the change that I want to see in the world. I want this story to inspire action. I want you to come out of here with your hair on fire, ready to fight. But finally, and most importantly, to Dwayne. I, I love you like a brother, and I'm so thankful that you have let me work on your case, and you've allowed me to share your story with the world, so I thank you. All right, here we go. I don't know why I wear a jacket these things, I always take them off, so there you go. All right, y'all ready? <laughs> no more pleasantries, no more thank yous. I still love Joan, but no more thank yous, here we go. I live by a few pretty simple maxims. Come on, chair. All right, here we go. Most of them I learned when I was a young kid, in a Franciscan parish in northern New Jersey. First, we all have a duty to do good. Does anybody here know who said that? Any parents? I, actually, we'll teach like, just like a law school class. Mr. Smith, please stand up. <laughs> what is the answer? Okay, Mr. Smith's not here. Um, does anybody know who said that? Not me, that's my head. That guy in the back in the white, Pope Francis. He said that. That's a Pope selfie. I did a terrible job of it. That's my head. That's a Pope. He said, well, we need to do good. Second is, for it is in giving that we receive. Anybody? Come on. Come on. Thank Francis. Thank you. The third one. Forgiving doesn't make you weak. It sets you free. Anybody know who said that? Anybody? I'll give you the answer later. Finally, though, this is how I try to live my life every day. I try to act justly, love mercy, and to walk humbly with my God. And I ask that you all do that every single day. <laughs> okay, imagine this. Third year law student, which some of you here are. DC law students in court, get your first case. I'm not a lawyer yet, I go to court, represent a guy, Phil, charged with stealing a bike. I go downstairs, interview him, say I'm ready, ready to fight. Go to the court, cross his name with a police officer, argue to the judge. He's not guilty. The judge is like, uh-uh, guilty. I go downstairs and lock up. I say, man, I'm so sorry. I worked as hard as I could. He said, don't worry about it. I stole the bike. <laughs> <laughs> but, but what he said next was a rocket right to my heart. He said, hey, I've been through the system so many times. Nobody cared about me like you. You stood up for me. Thank you for standing up for me. So here I am, 20-something years old, son of a carpenter, don't know shit about anything. And I know what I'm going to do with my life and my career. I'm going to fight for those who don't have a voice. I was a public defender in Brooklyn, where I defended thousands of defendants, the guilty, the innocent, the misunderstood, and everywhere in between. And I learned so much in that time, I encourage all of you to do that if you can. First, there's a story in every single person. You got to know them deeply. And second, nobody's as bad as their worst act. And so then I went to work for a large law firm because I had to pay off my law school loans. <laughs> Still paying them. Okay. <laughs> Not if you buy some books today. <laughs> Final payment. Thank you. All right, good. Thank you. That, 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 that was fun. Here we go. Okay. So I'm sitting in my law, in my big fancy law firm. Five, six hundred bucks an hour charging these big major clients. All of a sudden, I get a phone call from a partner who says, 
hey, you were a public defender once, right? I said, yep. He said, good. You're going to Texas tomorrow. You want to work on a death penalty case pro bono? I said, absolutely. And I met Dwayne. He was arrested in April 2003 and sentenced to death in October 2005 for a crime he did not commit. I flew down to Texas to Houston, drove 60 miles north to Livingston, and I sat on death row and I looked at him. And I knew the moment I met him that he was innocent, that he had not committed this crime. I knew it like a shot right to my heart, like when I met my wife for the first time right out there, or something really deep when you hold your child for the first time, or something in truth you know. But when I walked out that day, I felt sick. In fact, I threw up right next to the rental car, because it hit me right away. This wasn't Brooklyn, this wasn't a bike, this was death row in Texas. So I'm heading back to the airport, I got some of that disgusting airport Chinese food, you know what I'm talking about? They, they give you the free sample, it makes you sick. I had the, the fortune right here from 2007. It says, you love challenge. And I looked up and I said, really? I said, I said, this is the challenge. I can't just be a good dad and a good husband and a good parishioner. I have to do this. But I said, you know what? I'm in. This one's not a funny slide. It's an incredibly sad slide. Officer Charles Clark and Alfredia Jones were murdered on April 3rd, 2003. I say prayers for their families all the time. Senseless murder that did not have to happen. Happened right here. Kind of a nondescript, kind of crappy strip mall in South Houston. It was supposed to be an inside job. It was supposed to be 300 grand sitting in that check cashing store. Three men did it, truck drivers saw it. Here's two of them. Lines Joe Bayer over here, sentenced to death for shooting Ms. Jones. He's on death row right now. Deshaun Glassby over there got 30 years in exchange for testifying against Dwayne and Joe Bayer in separate trials. And Dwayne was convicted of murdering Officer Charles Clark. It was a three-day trial. Just think about that for a second. I'm about to start next Monday a six-week trial. Six weeks. And the most that my client could probably do is two or three years. Three days. It was as if guilt was foretold from the very beginning. Fast food death penalty, right? And Dwayne was very frustrated with the defense. He told me the first day, he'll tell you outside. He was nowhere near this scene. He was at his girlfriend's apartment, made a phone call to where she worked, and that's it. Very straightforward alibi. But his lawyers decided to come up with a theory that he was merely present, shopping at the furniture store. No one's going to believe that. But then that's what she said, opening and closing, saying, sorry I said that. No, no, he wasn't there. They didn't call a single witness. They didn't put up any experts. Nothing. They gave up. He was very frustrated. The only time he spoke was during sentencing. He put his hand up and he said, these people are trying to take my life away from something I didn't do. I didn't do this crime. He's trying to let people take my life from something I didn't do. But no one was listening to him. This is him on death row. You look a lot thinner there, man. What you need is it's a These were attorney visits, not, not touched at all. But some jails I go to, you can touch the defendant. This one you couldn't, it's all behind glass. Those crappy phones that never worked. This is where we lived for 10 years, guys. Think about this. He's a big guy, as you see, he's got arms like this. He can touch the side of the damn cell. He can touch it flat-footed. 23 hours a day, 24 on the weekend. The only hour by himself was in a wreck yard. No other, no human contact. He would tell me that the only human contact you get, if the guards are in a good mood, you stick your index finger through the little lattice work of your cell. When other guys come by, you can do a touch like that. We all take touch for granted, but he, was, he couldn't touch anything or anybody for all those years. And this is where he was heading. I put this slide up here to shock you. I hate this slide. But this is where he was heading. And every time I see this slide, I'm going to cry a little bit inside. And I'm also getting incredibly angry inside because this, for all the talk about the death penalty, this is where it happens. A nondescript, ugly color room where medicine is injected into his body. But if I had anything to say about it, that was never going to happen. And here we are. And this is where lawyer client turned into brotherhood and turned into true love. Now, Death Row is a pretty shitty place um, to visit, to live at, as you would say. <laughs> no fun. But I would try to cheer it up. Lawyers could bring $20 of vending machine quarters, and I bought so much food for him. It was like we had many Thanksgivings every time. Chicken nuggets, cheeseburgers, key lime pie walnuts, if you remember that, pecan pie, Hershey bars, Hawaiian punch. I spent 20 bucks, and the guard would bring there and lay it all out for him. And we'd sit there for hours. And I wouldn't talk about the case, because I knew what the case was. He told me already. I wanted him to know there was someone out there who cared for him, who loved him, who would stop at nothing until he was out. We'd sit there, and we'd talk. 
I learned about his family. I learned about who he was, who he is in here, which is what I try to do with every one of my clients. Not only did I do that, I also tried to mess with the guards a little bit. Because <laughs> I'm from New Jersey, what are you going to do? Uh, <laughs> any Jersey in the house? Come on, it's got to be some Jersey in the house. There we go. There we go. Thank you. I love this place. There we go. All right, so first time I came up to the, to the to death row in the, the rental car, the cop shows up, uh, the sheriff's straight out of Central Casting, big 10 gallon hat, boots, the whole deal, gun. And he's like, boy, what are you doing here? I looked at my license. It was from Virginia, right? Not my Jersey license, Virginia. He's like, what are you doing here, Yankee? I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so I said, I'm coming to see you guys. He's like, good luck, right? So the next day, I come again, and he's like, open your trunk. So I do that. Open your hood, open all that crap. And I go in. I leave. He says, open your trunk. I said, nope. He said, open your trunk. I said, I won't. He shows his gun like he's going to shoot me. I'm like, yeah, go ahead and shoot me. And I say, I'm not going to do it. He's like, why? I said, because Dwayne's in the trunk. I'm breaking him out. <laughs> and he, he gets his gun. He goes, I'm like, relax, dude. Dwayne's not in the trunk. And then the next time I came back, he said, you really got me there, Yankee. He's still going in. There you go. <laughs> All right, so you wonder, what was the case made of, right? You figure if someone goes to death penalty in this country, they got to have some good, strong evidence. Uh-uh. No forensics, no DNA, no gunshot residue, no CSI evidence, nothing that you see on TV. Just witness identifications, and Dwayne, Sean Glassby testified and got 30 years in exchange. First witness said that she saw him from there. How do I know I took this picture? Because as a public defender, it taught me you work. You go hard, you go investigate, you go where they say that they said they were. You don't sit in your office, you figure stuff out. I stood right here and I said, you can see him from here? In that car where that thing is? It looks far away because it is. I said, you can see him? She said, no. I said, well, then why did you say that at trial? And this is when I began to realize, folks, I was not just up against the Texas death machine, which was hard enough as it is. I was going up against corruption. I was going up against racism. I was going up against hatred. She said to me, Daily, cops and DAs would come by and say, hey, you better say in trial, you saw Dwayne in that car. I'm going to take your kids away. I'm going to make your life miserable. She had a kid with cerebral palsy in a wheelchair. I'm going to take your vouchers away. I'm going to make your life horrible. And so she said, fine, I'll say whatever you want. This is going to make you mad in about 25 minutes. At trial, they presented these fancy maps. This is 2003. Dwayne didn't have a cell phone back then. Deshaun Glaspie did. Deshaun Glaspie testified that Dwayne used his cell phone, pretty convenient, A. And then B, they take Deshaun Glaspie's cell phone records to show where the phone was. And we talked to the jurors, and they were like, oh, that's pretty compelling evidence. You're going to find out this is the most horrible evidence that the jury saw. Nowhere, though, guys, was the pressure more severe than against his girlfriend, Erica Docker. Because you remember, that's where he was. He was at her house. But she gives a statement to the, to the grand jury, which is a kind of room like this, not open to the public, in which the prosecutor stands here, witness here, grand jurors here listen to testimony. She gave a statement to the police, yes, when I left for work that morning, he was home. And yes, at about 10 o'clock in the morning, I got a phone call from my home, because I know, because I was working for an elderly woman as a home health aide, looked down at the caller ID box. Who here younger than 20 knows what a caller ID box is? Anybody? Okay, good. Um, it says, who's calling, right? And so she testifies that way in the grand jury and to the cops. And then she gets badgered and threatened by the DA, Dan Rizzo, the four-person for the future. If you read a grand jury transcript and the four-person of the grand jury knows the prosecutor's first name, you should probably be wary of that. He says, hey, Dan, what are the punishments for perjury and aggravated perjury? Up to 10 years in prison. This is where I do dramatic. Oh, in prison? And if the evidence shows you're perjuring yourself, you're going to go to the penitentiary and see your kids for a long time. Tell us the truth. He wasn't there, right? Tell us the truth. He was gone. Tell us the truth. Think about your kids. She holds firm. Yes, he was there. But you know what? That truth didn't work for the DA in a non-scientific case where only had witnesses. He needed the witness where he was to flip and say no. So he decided on his own to charge her with perjury, not believing her and asked to set a high bail, 15,000 bucks, which might have been a billion to her. She sat in jail for four months. Think about that. He cooled her out for four months, knowing he had the ability to do that, and he did it. And she sat there, lost her job, CPS was calling, lost her apartment. She's like, fine, I'll say whatever you want me to say. So at trial, she said, Dwayne was not there when I left, and the phone call did come in, but even though she saw already, it came in from somewhere else. And that, my friends, 
is the sum, hey, my man, how are you? <laughs> College student, they not even listening, I'm, I'm getting him in early, Dean. He'll be here. Free acceptance, I already, already, already got this. Uh, and I did tell you 12.15, but it's 12.30, come on. Yeah. All right, here we go. <laughs> so, so she was in jail, comes out. That is the sum and substance of the evidence against an innocent, decent, good man. A identification from a sewer break miles and miles away, 30 years sentence from Sean Glassby and Eric Dockery, and that is it. So you remember this, hey Dan business, the four person and the threatening? Well, it turns out that that person was a police officer. And no matter what you think about the system, this is broken. To have a police officer be the four person of a grand jury, of a four person grand jury in a police officer shooting case, okay? And then we discovered something even more horrible. Texas was the last state in the union to do something called pick a pal grand juries, in which the judge appoints a commissioner, usually a friend, who then brings literally friends to the grand jury. And with no offense to the old white people in the room, it's all old white people sitting in judgment of minorities charged with crimes in one of the most diverse cities in the country. And we begin to realize that people are in grand juries all the time. And of course, if they're friends with the cops, they're friends with the DA, what are they going to do? Indict, 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 indict. And you know what? People say we have the best system in the country. We don't, okay, in the world. That's all right, but this is broken, okay? You cannot have a police officer be a foreperson of a grand jury in a police officer shooting case. But I'm happy to tell you that that practice, pick a pal, was abolished because of this case, okay? Because having a police officer as foreman of a grand jury investigating police shootings is not the way to be able to have confidence in the system. And this bill will correct that. And I've gotten a lot of calls about this case. But this, I've got a lot of calls from defense lawyers who tell me, you know what, great for Dwayne, we're happy for him, but this changed the game because marginal cases are not being brought to the grand jury because they know they're not going to get a rubber stamp. Regular people of Houston are going to grand juries now. So this is one of, not only did we get Dwayne out, we changed the system in Texas and made it better. Back to Erica. Oh my God, Erica. She would not talk to me. I would get a hot tip of where she lived. I fly down there, knock on the door, she slammed the slam door in my face. We got no hot tip where she lived. I sat on it all day, even jumped into a trash dumpster to see if she had a mail her name on it. She did, so I sat there all day and day. She didn't show up. She would duck me. Because last time she got involved and told the truth, she went to jail. But then, in a moment of beauty, Anthony Graves, who's on death row with Dwayne Exonery number 12, uh, Dwayne Exonery 13, called me and said, hey, Brown don't belong here. A lot of guys do. Brown doesn't. And I said, well, then help me. And he went and knocked on Erica's door and said, hey, talk to his lawyers, will you please? Because Anthony said, my girlfriend was also pressured. Please come and talk to them. So she did. I flew down on a Sunday, had a dinner with her at a Cajun restaurant in Houston. I said, hey, please, I can't put you in jail. Can't take your kids away. Can't do nothing. Just tell me the truth, good, bad, or otherwise. I said, was he home when you left work that morning? She started to cry. She said, yes. And I said, did you get a call that morning? Yes. I said, please, just tell me where it came from, good, bad, or otherwise. She said, it came from my house. And she was relieved. She also told me that Dan Rizzo, when she testified in the grand jury that she was earlier, put her in a locked room in a break and said, if you don't tell me what I want, I'm going to make you a co-defendant with your boyfriend and give you the needle too. You tell me what I want. So she told me this. Those are her words right there. My handwriting is terrible. I actually had to rewrite a, a, a exam. Do you guys still do the handwrite exams here? No. I had to handwrite one, and I got a call from Dean Garcia who said, we can't read a single word you said, we're going to do that. <laughs> so there's an ethical issue there, right? Because like, I come in, I'm like, that wasn't a good answer. But if I write something above it that's a better answer, what can I get? But I wrote my same crappy answers, I got to see, there we go, move on. <laughs> Irony, that was criminal law! <laughs> So, Erica gives me an affidavit exposing the fact that she was true when she said that Dwayne was home. But I knew I knew, I knew he did more. Elijah Jobert, Dwayne called me one day. We actually called him on his birthday and he said, hey, Jobert's next door. He said he'd be willing to talk to you. We talked to his lawyer. Ethical point for your ethics credit. If someone's represented by a lawyer, you got to call him first. Hey, can I talk to him? He said, yes, I went down there. I went down there. I said, hey, we're here. This, this, this is going to crack you up. I'm here. I said, hey. He said, Brown doesn't belong here. I said, no shit! I can't <laughs> And he said, I said, tell me who did it. He said, I ain't no snitch, I ain't telling you nothing. So here, I spent $2 of my $20, and a quarter, on a chicken sandwich for him. And so the jailer comes and sandwich, I said, no, don't give him that sandwich. 
He's like, what are you doing? He's like, you're going to mess with me, I'm going to mess with you. I'm hungry, I'm going to eat the sandwich right in front of you, right here. <laughs> and he said, fine, I'll talk. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, the cops get threatened, live to go to jail. I threatened him with a $2 chicken sandwich. <laughs> and then he sat back and said, like, okay, let's go. I said, well, what if I tell you who I think did it? Because we've done a thorough investigation. I told him who I thought it was. And he leans back and he's like, how the hell do you know that? And for the next two hours, tells us everything that only someone involved would know. And then he wrote us an affidavit. It said, Alfred Wayne Brown was not involved in any way with the incident on April 3rd, 2003, nor present at the check cashing store on April 3rd, 2003. So I'm thinking we're doing pretty good, right? I got the affidavit from Erica, affidavit from Joe Bear, affidavit from the woman at the sewer break who said, I never saw him. I bring this all to the DA in Texas. I was like, hey, let's go. He's out. Throw me a parade. It's time. She says this. Ready? All you fast talking, it's not very fast talking as you've seen. You know, you have to lot for um, All you fast talking Yankee lawyers, again with the Yankee stuff, come down here to Texas to say the system's broken, to say you guys are innocent. Good luck. He's going to die. And, oh my God. <laughs> my dad's a carpenter from New Jersey. He would have punched her in the face. <laughs> Me, I wanted to, but I didn't. I just said, you know what? I said, I'll be back. And I ran out. <laughs> here we go. Alright, come to the good parts now. Okay, remember, I told you, the phone call. Erica said she saw it in the caller ID box. Dwayne told me he made that damn call. So for years, I tried to find the phone record that proved it. Subpoena the DAs. Nah, we don't have it. Subpoena the cops. Nah, we don't have it. Subpoena the phone company. Nah, we don't have it. I was extraordinarily depressed. I don't normally say this, but for three years, my thumb did not stop twitching. I go to the doctor, I was like, what is this? He's like, are you stressed? I said, a little bit. <laughs> because I knew that without that magic piece of evidence, I probably would not be able to save this man's life. And I'd go see him. And I'd say, man, I'm so sorry that I can't find these curse, 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 curse phone records. And you know what? He's in a box like this and like this. He gave me peace. He gave me comfort. He gave me love. He said to me, I, I believe in you. And the truth will come down. And sometimes I wasn't so sure. Until we got this. This one's beating up a little bit. Um, we get an email from the DA, the one who went like this. And I'm going to read it to you. It's a real email, a real person, to a real judge. The purpose of this email is to let you know that Craig McDaniel, the HPD officer who testified regarding telephone records of the Brown trial, delivered to me today a box of materials related to the phone records in the Brown case. Officer McDaniel found these records over the weekend in cleaning out his garage. That's a real email from a real DA to a real judge and a real defense lawyer. And so, you wonder, what was in there, right? It got sent to my colleagues in Dallas. I said, hey, what's in there? They opened it up, ah, it seems like a phone record we've already seen. Go back to my desk, not thinking anything of it. And then they called back 30 minutes later, like you're sitting down, and there it was. Right there, in the middle of a box in a cop's garage. The phone record that I've been looking for for years. Not only that, cop's handwriting on it. Doby, his nickname's girlfriend's landline in the South Loop up there. The call was even highlighted. Okay. <laughs> Sitting in a box in a garage, guys. But you know what was worse? It was what was attached to it. A subpoena from Dan Rizzo, the DA who subpoenaed the phone company the day after Erica testified about the call to see if she was telling the truth. And guess what? She was. But this record never made it to his defense lawyers at trial. It was never turned over, was shelved, was hidden, was thrown away, was put into a curse, 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 curse garage. So, that's my garage. 
my wife hates that I put this slide up across the country, but it is, it's a mess. We have three kids, give me a break. The, uh, <laughs> that weed whacker doesn't work, the tires are flat. I haven't mowed the lawn in two years, but that's okay. <laughs> but my daughter said to me, why would there be documents in a garage when ours looks like this? And she's absolutely right. I called the DA though, and I said, the ones that sit like this, I said, remember that I'll be back? I'm back, what are you gonna do about this? And she said, I'll call you right back. And a few minutes later, she agreed to a new trial without a hearing, which is what I've been told has never happened before in Texas. We go to court, and the judge says, I'm meaning what I say. As soon as we can, with cooperation of the Court of Criminal Appeals, we'll give you the trial you deserve. Justice is coming, right? Well, in Texas, what the judge says, the trial court has to be adopted by the appellate court. It's kind of just a procedural thing in that state. So the appellate court had to say, okay, that makes sense. Two parties agree to a new trial. He wants a trial as soon as we can. This court waited 17 months. Oh my God. My thumb was about to fall off. 17 months, okay? Oh my God. This case is what makes me, I mean, I'm mad about a lot of stuff. Dwayne's so damn peaceful, but I am not. I am so angry all the damn time. <laughs> Except when I'm with him, then he makes me happy. Thank you. <laughs> So they issue opinions every Wednesday. Every Wednesday, wake up like Christmas morning. Run downstairs, oh, there's a presence. And I go, and I go on the website. Control F, Brown. Nope, nope, nope. One time there was a Brown, it was Anthony Brown, so close. Next time it was John Brown. I was like, what the, why is there so many Browns in Texas? And then I realized, the, the Houston Chronicle told us, you know what, it's an election year. There's no way a appellate court was all elected, by the way, one of the problems that I note in my book. All elected would never give him a new trial in election year. And boy, did that piss me off. Because here he is on death row with the document that shows he was home. A landline phone record, not the cell phones. You don't even have landlines anymore? No. Your parents do. <laughs> you don't. The landline showing he was home. 17 months come and go. You see what November 4th is, don't you? 2014? Election day. <coughs> All the Republican judges, and no offense, Republicans. Democrats, whatever, you can be whatever you want. Just don't be unfair. Don't be unjust. Don't be cruel. And this was cruel, 17 months of waiting. November 4th, they got elected. Congratulations to them. November 5th, Wednesday, they issue a two-page opinion, vacating his conviction and sending it back down to the trial court for a new trial. Two pages, actually not really two pages, like, you know, maybe one page, just squeeze it all in. Eight and a half months per page it took him to do this damn thing. By that time, though, I was furious, because I'm like, you're messing with the wrong guys here. The only benefit of those 17 months was the Houston Chronicle got involved. And they really got in deep in the case. They won their first Pulitzer ever for this case, for the coverage of this case. And I'm the damn source, so I should get a Pulitzer too, but I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> nothing, nothing. Anyway. So, but then for a, he got released. I mean, November 5th, 2014, left death row about a month later, went back down to Harris County awaiting his retrial that we knew would never happen because the phone record showed what it showed. But then he had to wait another seven or eight months till June 8th, 2015, and after very careful consideration, I'm dismissing the case because it's the right thing to do. I need applause right now. This is the... Fifth greatest day of my life. First, of course, when I met my wife right outside. <laughs> there she is at the last speech a couple years ago. You look good there, man. Still look good. <laughs> I look terrible, but that's okay. My wife looks great. These three dummies. Uh, um, two, three, four, the birth of my kids. Fifth is 1986. <laughs> anybody? Anybody? The Dwayne's here, so that he's above the Mets, but it's close. It's right next to each other. All right, we'll stay on the Mets for a little bit. Uh, I'll go back to my kids. I'll go back to my kids. That's good. Okay. All right. A couple updates. He's released June 8, 2015. Dan Rizzo was interviewed about these phone records, and here's what he says. Well, I don't think I was still. I wanted to find out if this guy was innocent. I was shocked it was there. It should have been turned over to the defense. He came out trying to say all these things that made him seem like, oh, it was in the cop's garage. I had no idea about it. Well, ask Kate Edwards about this one. Because of Kate, and because of the lawsuit she filed, 
and because of the discovery she filed, and the fact that she's a justice warrior like me, doesn't give up, fights all the way, we got discovery that showed he was lying. April 22nd, 2003, three weeks after the murder, Breck McDaniel, the cop in the garage, emails Dan Rizzo and says, holy shit, the phone records proved he was home. This is a new development. It looks like the call detail records show he was home. But did they turn the phone records over? No. Did they turn this email over? No. Did Breck McDaniel testify at trial about the records? No. So you want to get angry? This is how you get angry. And when we found this out, when Kate and I found this out, more Kate than me because she's far smarter than I am, but that's cool. <laughs> I, I realized something really, really bad. That this may have been intentional conduct by a DA and a police officer to railroad and frame a good, innocent, decent man. And to the DA's credit, when they found this out, they filed a bar complaint against Dan Rizzo. Rizzo was informed of the existence of the records. He had failed to disclose them to the defense counsel or the jury. Without access to the records, the defense was unable to use them in Brown's defense. Accordingly, they'll notify the State Bar of Texas to investigate the prosecutor's professional conduct while handling the cases. You know what this country needs more of? Is accountability. This prosecutor needs to be held to account. The cop needs to be held to account. Why was the documents in the garage? Why did you not turn them over? I'm happy to tell you that, as an update, a, a special counsel has been appointed to investigate Wayne's case and determine whether he is actually innocent or not. And I hope and I believe that in a very short order, the world will hear the special counsel's report that he is actually innocent of this crime. And when that happens, I will finally take a deep breath. But until that time, we, we continue to fight. When he got out, Houston Chronicle wrote this editorial, An Innocent Man. I have about 10 copies of this. When I was on the plane on the way back from Houston, I don't normally say this to him, I'm gonna anyway. I put this up against the, the, the windows I was flying out, I said, kiss my ass, I'm never coming back. <laughs> then my book came out, someone offered me an appearance fee, so I went. <laughs> I got kicked. <laughs> Another big reason to rethink capital punishment. Look, I'm not here to change your mind on this. I'm here to lay it out for you, okay? I speak across the country at churches, schools, everywhere else, and I've changed a lot of minds. But think about it. A document in a garage that was just found like this? A team of people? I get to tell the story because I became his brother and I love him. But there's a team of lawyers who love him. And but for thousands of hours, over a million dollars in pro bono fees, guys. Think about that. A million bucks of fees for one man's life. We can't have a system like that. Cannot. First, I believed it on a religious basis. Now I believe it on a legal basis. You know, there aren't many rich white people on death row. Indigent people can't afford counsel. You saw the state of Washington just yesterday got rid of it because it's cruel and racist. And it needs to end. You don't believe me? Believe Rick Perry. Woo, Rick Perry. Okay. <laughs> okay. I put this on the side for the right wing groups I go to. I don't know where you all stand. Some of the parents may be right wing. It's fine. If you're left wing and you're 20, that's where you should be. If you're right wing and you're 20, come on. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Hey, my speech, if you get a guy out, come on up here and say something different. It's all good. Okay. So, but I put this up here for the right because Rick Perry said at a speech that I didn't go to, didn't talk to him about, never met the man, wouldn't talk to him, wouldn't even say hi to him if he walked by me, he would say, when, because he got charged with a crime too, if y'all remember. And he had fancy lawyers and got cases dismissed. He said, when ambitious lawyers, prosecutors go overboard, the true victims aren't people like you or me. They're people like Erica and Alfred and have the means to fight back. This is Rick Perry. So now the circle is complete. It's not just a fast-talking Yankee liberal from New Jersey. It's Rick Perry! <laughs> All right, this is my favorite slide. That's my daughter, Audrey. Um, this was the day I got the case. She hugged him this morning on the way to school. And that's her on release day, the one closer to me. And that's her older sister, Ella. So it took from there to there for one man's life. Oh my God. And that's Dwayne on release day. And guys, that's his daughter, okay? Who didn't get to have a father for 12 years and 62 days. I got to have mine 
And I tried to be there for her, buy her school supplies, take her to dinner, buy her what she needed, send her birthday stuff, would report to Dwayne how she was doing in school, but it wasn't the same. You need your father. I promised her I'd get her father back, and I was never so sure. Here's another picture. That's his sister. And crazy Pat, you know crazy Pat, right? <laughs> I found out about this thing, and I couldn't get there in time, so Pat, when the death penalty abolitionist got there, said, I got the hug before you did, as a fan But this picture, oh my god, I love this picture. I can look at this all day. I flew in the next day, and a 5 o'clock flight got there, and I jumped into his arms. The Washington Post did a series, did a thing on this, there's a video of me jumping into his arms, and he just carried me around like a dog. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not recreate that, though. I mean, <laughs> I love this picture. Finally, after all these years, I could actually hug him. And I love hugging him. I'm going to hug him in about three minutes. I want you to hug him outside. Very huggable. Great guy. We got these two. They're real. Um, his is on his arm because he's a lot stronger. It looks a lot better. Mine's on my shoulder. And as we, despite my kids thought they are temporary ones that come off, this one does not come off. This is a real one. Gives me a lot of credibility at my neighborhood pool. Um, <laughs> So I, I do a lot of book clubs and signings. I said this one. I said, if you buy 10 copies of the book, I'll take my shirt off and show it to you. This lady says, I'll buy 10. I was like, okay, great. She's like, let's go. Take your shirt off. <laughs> so since then, it offers off the table. Maybe by like 20, I might take it off. All right. So he's, he's got 154 on there. You know what? He's 154th exoneree. Think about that from Death Row National. 154 people go to Death Row thinking they're going to die, and they walk out. That system is broke. It's now up a couple. And then he's the 13th from Texas. Texas executed more than 500 people, but only 13 walked? I know for a fact, because it was proven that Cameron Todd Willingham in Texas was executed, even though he was innocent. Our buddy Rick Perry signed a death warrant for someone, and he was innocent. He laid there dead. He was convicted of arson and murdering his children in the house. First he had to deal with that grief, and then he had to die for something he didn't do. The system is busted. needs to stop. When he got out, uh, we took him to get some oysters. That was a good day. He ate all of these like so quick. And that's his daughter right there. I love this picture so much. It's reconnection. It's love to me. Oh, I'm not going that slide. I hate that slide. Um, <laughs> but you know what's also beautiful about this? Is his peace and his grace. He stayed on the courthouse steps when he got out that day. I have no hate in my heart for what they did to me. Think about that for a second. You know, we just got to love everyone, he said. He came out talking words of love and togetherness. And for that, he is a far better person than I will ever be. And I love him dearly for that. He gave me a grace and a peace that I'll never, ever, ever have. I still don't understand it. Because I'm angry. But he is not. He moves forward with love in his heart. I hate this slide. Why is it up here? Oh, my God. <laughs> so... You know, I think you understand the irony here. Um, I'm a Mets fan, hate the Yankees, I've always hated the Yankees. They stink, they buy titles, they play, you know. Uh, and so he gets out and he says, What do you want to do? He's like, I want to go to Yankee Stadium. I'm like, damn it! <laughs> so we happen to have a friend who worked there, and he got us really good seats right behind the dugout and gave him a, a, a jersey and a hat. I wore that hat for the picture, threw it off, and like, never wear that hat again. <laughs> Yankees, come on now, Dwayne. This, this one here, I love. We, we did an on-location shoot for the, uh, the uh, Today Show, and if you go find that, you'll see his piece. He loves being outside. He loves being, oh, loves being with horses. He loves being free. This one's great, because it's an advertisement for the law school. <laughs> Thanks to Katie on the sweatshirt. Um, you carved those pumpkins for me a couple years ago. Um, my family loves him. Uh, he slept in our house. My kids call him Uncle Wayne. They love him, and, and I love him as well. This one. Mm, mm, mm. So last Christmas, I texted him. I said, "What do you want? Get you anything you want, man. Anything." Except another trip to the East. And he texted me this. He's like, "I got all I need, man. I'm good." He is free. He is happy. He is a model for how to live your life through adversity. But well, folks, I have a challenge for you. There's my book. You're all, parents are obligated to buy it. Sorry, it's just price of admission. Um, <laughs> buy it for your kids, especially the first years who are struggling. They need, they need to know why they become a winner. But I have, a, I have a challenge for all of you. You know, during this time, I rely on my faith more than I ever had before. Was my career and my life worth this one man's life that no one was standing up for? 
and it was. It was in my giving of time and love to him that I received a bounty I can't even describe to you. I am whole in a way I never thought I could be. My thumb ain't twitching anymore. His freedom set me free too. He's like a brother, and he gave me God's grace. Because folks say I saved his life, but I didn't. He saved mine. His message of love and peace coming out, we can all learn from and apply every day. 12 years, 62 days in a cell, as you can touch side to side for a crime he didn't commit, and he comes out and he says, I'm okay. My family's okay, I'm moving forward. Should put a lot of things in perspective for the people here in this room. He came out forgiving his captors. It's the embodiment of the prayer I say all the time, it's pardoning we are pardoned. It's forgiving that we are forgiven. So now I want to ask you, do you know who said that third quote I put up earlier? Forgiving doesn't make you weak, it sets you free. Do you have any idea who said that? Modern day philosopher and poet, Alfred Dwayne Brown. He is truly one of the most amazing people I've ever met. So I ask you, in fact, I challenge you, what will you do? Who will you stand up for? What will you stake your life for? What will you stake your career for? Will you persevere even when it's hard? Will you have the courage when everyone's telling you to stop, to keep going? Will you stay in a fight even when things get hard? When your thumb starts, can't stop twitching and everyone's telling you what the heck are you doing working on this case? Will you find your Dwayne in your lives? Will you stand up for someone without a voice? Will you do that? Will you use this law degree that you're about to get some of you, a couple of years from now, will you use this law degree for good? It's easy to make money. You have to do it. Because when you're old like me, or really old like your parents, <laughs> sorry, parents, you will not look at how much money's in your bank account, what kind of car you drive. You'll think about what you did. What did you do to make the world a better place? What did you do to help a person what would you do to speak for someone who had no voice? So please, as you embark out of this world, be that change, be that person, and find your own Dwayne. And now, my absolute favorite part of my presentation is to introduce to you my brother, my friend, Alfred Dwayne. come talk to us, grab a beer, grab some food, we're not going anywhere, we have the table signing books if you'd like one, no pressure, it's kind of kidding, um, not really, but please, Bob, please, please come see us, but please also just enjoy your time here, soak it all in, I love all of you, see ya. before that I wanted to share again today, and it's a very vivid memory of mine. Um, when I was a law student here at Catholic, some 10 years ago or so, when uh, Ryan Stolarz came to speak to us as students about a case that he was involved in in the representation of a young man on death row, and I will never forget um, words that we just heard today coming out of Ryan that afternoon of, I'll be back, um, and I will be back when Mr. Brown is a free man. So for us to come full circle and to have Al uh, Mr. Brown here with us again today is um, just something I'll never forget. I, I, I can't tell you how thrilled we are 
um, that you're part of our family and our community, and how proud I am to continue to add to your wardrobe um, <laughs> <laughs> and giving you another a new CUA law uh, <laughs> today to wear proudly. And we're so thrilled that you're here with us today. So thank you, thank you both very much. Come on, let's have some fun.